Well, thank you everyone for coming to my talk. Uh, I know we're up against lunch, so I appreciate you uh, for going lunch for a few more minutes. Uh, this talk specifically is entitled uh, Becoming a Cyborg, kind of my first steps into implantable technology. It's something that I started to research over the last uh, several months to a year or so, and I kind of wanted to share my beginning steps with you. Um, I work for a company called Sikich. Uh Basically, we are a IT consulting firm. We do everything from penetration testing, forensics work, uh, to implementations, so kind of a one-stop shop as far as uh, IT consulting goes. Uh, so if you need assistance with that, uh, you know, give us a call, look us up. Uh, they're paying for me to be here, so that's that's their shameless plug. <clears throat> a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a penetration tester by day. I also currently run the uh, Mini Opponent Project, which I took over from my good friend Kevin Bong. Uh, Kevin and I also run a uh, YouTube show called Mayhem Lab, where we do... Uh, really stupid things with electronics. Uh, so if you have time to waste, you can t certainly look that up. <clears throat> so kind of a real quick agenda today. We are going to talk about biotechnology, and biohacking, kind of what is it. Um, look at the different types of implants, what people are doing with these implants, and uh, kind of talk about what you would want to think about if you're interested in getting an implant. Uh, I do have a uh, demonstration of, uh, I've got a video on how I was actually implanted and then uh, how it actually works, and then talk a little bit about the lesson learned. Uh, <clears throat> I always like to throw the disclaimer up here that we do have some quote-unquote disturbing images because we can't talk about biohacking without getting our hands a little bit dirty. So uh, if you're squeamish, uh, you may want to you know, divert your eyes. Not every slide. So <clears throat> according to Wikipedia, which is the definitive source for absolutely everything, uh, biohacking is basically a social movement of people trying to use medical grade equipment to introduce technology with their bodies, right? I like to sum it up as it's an art form of modifying the human body to take advantage of technology. So how can we integrate the two? Uh, unlike the last talk, which was extremely interesting on nanotechnology, uh, we're not talking about that sort of integration. We're talking about putting something under your skin uh, or on your skin, something like that, that could then become useful to you. What's interesting is uh, if you guys have watched the uh, implant, implantable technologies movement over the last couple of years, uh, it's kind of starting to gain a little traction. Um, it's not a new phenomenon. It's actually been around for a long time. There was a, a program in 2004 called the Verichip, Verichip, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but it was uh, a program started by hospital systems to implant a basically an RFID tag in either your right shoulder or your right elbow region. The thought process was you go to the hospital and you're unconscious. You could actually get scanned when you enter into the emergency room and that ID would then reference uh, the, your medical records. So the implant itself didn't actually host your medical records, but it was just a way to look it up if you were, say, unconscious. Um, this died out relatively quickly. It's got about 300 people, the best I could figure out. Um, the main concern was that the implants were causing cancer. So, you know, it's probably bad for a hospital to give you cancer. Uh, so they stopped doing it. So a little bit of uh, different types of implants. Uh, as I said, we've got RFID. You're, you're, is everyone familiar with RFID, radio frequency identification tags, right? We all have one, our little white badges to get into things. Uh, NFC is actually a subset of RFID, so near field communication. Works specifically on the 13.65 megahertz range, so it's actually a, uh, a subset of RFID. In this shot, you can kind of see how big these, or how little these implants plants are. They're about the size of a grain of rice. Uh, if you want to take a look at one a little bit later, I don't know if you can see this, but I have one of the implants uh, taped to my business card. So it, oops, it's a very small little device. Um, <clears throat> basically, they're the same thing. They come in a little syringe, a little needle, that uh, it's very simple to inject into your skin, under your skin, which we'll see a little bit later. The uh, one that, um, I believe his name is Alex at cyberize.me, which is one of the places you can get these, and that information's at the end. Uh, is working on a thermometer. So it's interesting about this. You can implant the thermometer under your skin and you have a proprietary device that he came up with that you can go ahead and uh, scan that thermometer and get your uh, temperature at any given time. The downside is it works on a little bit of an odd frequency, so 134.2 kilohertz, and you do have to have the proprietary device. 
right? Haven't uh, really been able to figure out how to use it um, in other ways yet. So this is also an interesting one. It's uh, called uh, tritium. So it's the same substance that if you if you have a watch that's not a smart watch and actually has dials on it. If you ever notice, it's got little green tips on the uh, on the hands and it glows in the dark. That's basically what this substance is. So it glows under the skin. It's um, strictly aesthetic. So it's it's referred to as a firefly tattoo because uh, you can you know go to the rave and light up like a firefly, I guess. Don't know. But that's one of the type of implants people are doing. Uh, this one's really interesting as well. These guys uh, from Grindhouse Wetware. Uh, they're a very interesting group of individuals. I uh, haven't had a chance to meet them in person, but um, <clears throat> check out their site. They do very interesting work. They've got this device called the North Star. Currently, they've got version one, and to my knowledge, these are the only individuals that have it. Basically, it's a small disc, like a little puck, that they've sliced open their hand and then inserted it, um, and it and it glows when you you know shake it or you know, you know, they get close to each other. Um, it's completely aesthetic, uh, has no practical purpose. It's battery powered, so someday it will die and have to come out. Um, kind of sounds like a lot of fuss for not much, but they are working on version two. Uh, they say it's going to be rechargeable. I'm guessing that means wireless recharging versus uh, having a USB port on your hand. I'm not sure. But um, and they're also talking about building in some kind of technology to control other things like RFID or NFC. So not a lot of information on that yet. Um, but another interesting thing. So this is very interesting. Um, Gabriel. Gabriel uh, decided to give himself night vision. So basically what they did, and you can find the formula online. <clears throat> I didn't want to be responsible for ruining anyone's eyesight, so I didn't put it up here. But yeah, they worked out a, uh, a chemical formula and put it into a syringe. It's based off of um, what's called uh, CE6. But basically it's something that you can find in a type of fish, I believe, that uh, lives in the deep sea. They can uh, squirt it into your eye. Your eyes become basically black. You look like a, you know like a sci-fi creature, and uh, you can go ahead and go outside and see it in the dark. Uh, it's not really scientifically proven. You know, he did it to himself or had somebody else do it to himself. And um, there is no real scientific data that shows that you're going to actually get night vision. It does wear off after a couple hours. Um, this was pretty big when it came out last year, the year before. Uh, but what again, what's interesting is this isn't really new either. Um, they've been experimenting with this sort of technology uh, from 2006 in mice, rats. So we just decided to do it to ourselves as far as humans go. So then magnets. Uh, we all like magnetism, right? What a lot of people are doing for implants these days is putting magnets in their fingertips. Uh, they have kits that you can buy online to either do this to yourself. I've seen videos of people doing it to themselves. I'm not sure how drunk they actually were. Um, I don't think I could do this to myself. But uh, you numb yourself, take a scalpel, slice open your fingertip, insert a small, is it three millimeters by one millimeter, millimeter in size, so a very small magnet. You put one in each fingertip and people can actually f uh, detect magnetic fields. They feel a little tug on your, your fingers when you're around a magnetic field. Uh, people have reported, for instance, um, I read an article about a gentleman holding a vacuum cleaner cord. You could actually feel the electricity pulsing through the vacuum cleaner cord, things like that. Um, it's kind of interesting. I'm not quite sure what the practical use of having a magnet in your finger is. Um, I like practical implants, but uh, I guess if we come up with a practical use for magnetism. Then... This guy is probably one of the first um, legitimate implants that I've been able to find. Back in 2004, Neil here uh, had an implant put into the back of his skull. Uh, there's no information on the procedure. The doctors uh, remained anonymous because uh, it was one of the first times that they'd ever done this. But basically, he's colorblind. So what he's able to do is actually pick up uh, images through this camera, which converts it to sound. And he now can hear color through this uh, special device that he wears. It looks like kind of like a little antenna that scoops over his head. 
Uh, so some of the stuff has been around for a really long time. I think that's kind of what I wanted to get, you know, take these points to is it's not new. Uh, I know a lot of people have talked about it in the last couple of years, but it's relatively um, old stuff. We're just starting to see it kind of more mainstream. So now a little, a little bit more interesting stuff. So you have to select your implant and why do you want an implant? What do you want the implant to do? As you've seen uh, so far, most of the implants are aesthetic in nature. Uh, a lot of the, like the firefly tattoos or the North Star, things like that. People have LEDs implanted on their skin. Um, obviously, a big one is, you know, all your friends are doing it. That's how I got started in it because my good friend uh, Kevin was at a conference and he emailed me a picture and said, check out this really cool implant kit I just got. So about five seconds later, I said, yeah, I want one. Um, so he brought it home and, uh, you know, I had mine implanted and uh, he, he sadly never did. Um, Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> what do you want it to do, right? So we're going to talk about some of the little different chips that they have out there. Um, you know, NFC versus RFC, uh, I think, is the biggest um, debate right now. Of what what information do you want to store on your chip, and what is it that you want it to actually do for you? Um, there is. Uh, we were talking at DerbyCon a couple of weeks ago um, to an individual, and they're looking at NFC chips that have a little bit more storage and actually storing like your um, PGP key on it. So if you can imagine signing your documents literally with your you know, fingertip or palm of your hand or something uh, instead of actually pulling it out on a USB drive, which would be, I think, pretty cool. Very useful, right? So a couple of different chips uh, I wanted to look at. Um, these, there's a lot of them out there. These are the ones that I have uh, a little bit of experience with. So we've got the Mayfair cards. Those are your um, typical wristband key fob sort of thing. If we go to like, uh, I think Disney World is doing it now. A lot of the other theme parks, you get like a little wristband. And you walk up and you know, and you tap on it, and Mickey's head lights up or whatever, and you can get on your ride. Uh, that's NFC technology. In fact, uh, our hotel room doors, right? Is a, is a Mayfair kind of clone. Um, there's a couple of different sizes out there. So if you're going to look at getting something like this implanted, you want to be aware of how much data you need. Uh, one chip um, isn't necessarily the same. You'll notice there's a quite a range of sizes when it comes to capacity. You know, 48 bits to 128 bits. You know, versus 224 bits up to 4K. So look at the chip, understand what it is that you're actually getting, because um, you might actually find them online for 30 bucks. And it sounds like a great deal, and you get it, and it's much smaller. The data capacity is much smaller than you anticipated. So just be aware of that. Uh, when you get down to the NFC ones, which are the bottom two, the ATA5577 is the most common chip that you can get from uh, an RFID implantable uh, scheme. So and that's what comes in the little um, syringe that you can actually have implanted. That one will uh, mimic a head card. I guess I should also say the uh, EM410 will also mimic a head card. We found that one actually uh, in an RFID ring that we got. Um, I think that was just off Amazon for 20-ish dollars. And uh, since since Kevin couldn't have his implant, uh, we got a, you know he got a ring instead. Um, so we can use uh, he can use his ring to to badge into the office. So reading and writing these things, this is where it kind of gets very interesting. You guys ever heard, are you guys familiar with the Proxmark? So the Proxmark is a little tool, it's uh, about this big. In fact, it is just about this big, because this is one. Um, it's about $300, so it's a little bit pricey. Uh, <clears throat> but it's what's needed to actually write to these, um, NFC, or these RFID chips. The little thing on the right hand side of the screen is like kind of like a Chinese knockoff um, reader writer. What's interesting about that is it's fairly cheap. They're about 20 or 30 dollars, but they write a, uh, a password to the chip. So you have to use that reader then to rewrite the chip. The Proxmark doesn't do that. So it sounds like a great deal. Just be aware that you're going to need that writer in the future if you ever want to reprogram. There are ways to brute force it because the key space isn't that big. So if you can get a hold of a Proxmark or know someone has it, you can go ahead and brute force that key out and kind of clear that password. So something to think of. We specifically uh, use the 
Proxmark for all of our experiments because we had one. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Proxmark, it's pretty simple. You buy the device, you download the software, extract the software, uh, of course, plug the Proxmark in. There's a couple of real basic commands, and uh, see if I can. Well, I've got a demonstration for this in a little bit. But um, <clears throat> these are the basic commands. What you want to do, obviously, search to see if you can find your card. So I have a hid card. I'm going to need the ID off of this. And then the first thing, um, when you get the implant actually completed, so here's your injection needle, you actually get this implanted in you. Um, the first step is it's not set up to be a hid card yet. It's uh, just kind of like a generic chip. So we need to reprogram uh, block zero. Okay. So to do that, the command's on the screen. So the Proxmark has the ability to write to the, the T55 uh, series of chips. So you write block zero with that particular code. And um, you write that a couple times just to make sure that it's read it correctly. Now it, now it thinks it's a hid card. Now you can go ahead and actually program it as a hid card, right? So that's the big first magic step is make sure you program block zero first. Without that, it won't work. Trust me, we tried for a couple of days. Uh, I think I'm right in saying this slide took us about four days to write <laughs> of time. So seems simple, but it wasn't at first. Um, <clears throat> just a quick example. If you do uh, LF search, LF, by the way, is low frequency. We're working in the low frequency range with uh, these RFID or HID cards at uh, 125 uh, kilohertz. So we do the search. We find a tag. We get the tag ID. You'll see it right there, 0987654321. And then simply, again, we write block zero, and um, we write the actual ID to the card. Right, right to the chip. It's really that simple. So, let's see if I can do this successfully. Let's see if I can make that a little bit bigger. Okay, apparently not. Well, it's not going very well. So let's go ahead and try to program this card. Now, this particular rig that I've got up here is uh, just something that we threw together as a demonstration. Uh, it's got a HID badge reader, which got off of eBay for a couple bucks. Uh, Arduino is the brains and uh, some resistor, or excuse me, some uh, voltage regulators and, and switches. So this card right now is a clone of my actual badge, which unlocks the door. This badge does not unlock the door because it's just a fake badge. Right? So. Because I am not actually clinically insane, I'm not going to actually program this with my real ID. I'm going to take my real ID off of it so you don't see my real ID. Because <clears throat> then I have to be reprogrammed, and that's just a pain. So if I do my LF search, my badge, put it on the Proxmark, finds the ID. I apologize, it's hard to read, but... Uh, it's hard for me to read. There it is. There's the tag ID. Right? Just store that in Notepad real quick. I know how to computer. So just steal this string here real quick. And then what I'm going to do is take my sample, put it on the antenna, and basically you can write this as many times as you want. Uh, I recommend doing it at least four or five different times just to make sure that it's picked it up correctly. 
And what we can do is do the lf hit clone command. Oops, that's work. Get the ID from the last step. There it is. What's interesting about the proxmark is you actually never know if it successfully has written the tag or not. Um, but hopefully this will work. Now it says locked. So I've unprogrammed this as my batch and put it as somebody else's batch. Right. That was that was anticlimactic. So again, um, I've got the uh, RFID tag in my hand. Uh, just some of the uh, some of the things we've observed uh, playing with it is uh, is it secure? Is it not secure? It's a big question for us. Obviously, if you use a proxmark, being a penetration tester, one of the things that we do for social engineering is try to gain physical access into organizations. Um, I see a lot of people, and I just love them when they have their badge hanging off their belt. Those are my favorite kind of people because I can just walk up to them with this in my pocket and just kind of graze up against them and, oh, excuse me, sorry, I've, I've captured your badge ID now. Now I can go back to my car wherever, program me up a badge, and now I can walk into your organization, right? So that's that's one of the main uses for the, for the Proxmark. Um, we've tried to do that same sort of thing with the implant in my hand. We find it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to read it. Um, main reason being is the Proxmark works at five volts because it powers off a of USB. These things are up to 24 volts. So you need a lot more power to read the implant. Um, the antenna inside of the hid card that you have in your pocket is much more powerful. So just a real quick video of us doing this. And this is the ultimate case of uh, ask for forgiveness uh, because we did this at my office. Um, and then uh, we have this meeting every day when we talk about what we did yesterday and my coworker's like, yeah, I injected Micah with this chip and our boss just kind of looked at us. It's like, don't, don't do that <laughs> anymore. So, um, but it went pretty well. It's a pretty straightforward process. Um, it is a little bit of a needle poke. If you're familiar with giving blood, something like that, the needles are a lot smaller. This is a 14 gauge uh, needle, so it's much larger. If you want to take a look at it, I do have one up here. Uh, I highly recommend not touching it. It's, it's a needle. It's sharp. Um, as I poke myself as I try to put it away. Uh, this is him forgetting to take the stop out. There we go. <clears throat> that was fun. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, it's a pretty straightforward implant. What's also very interesting as well is it has actually moved around. It's migrated through the body. It wasn't supposed to, apparently, but it did. There it is. You can sort of see it right under my skin, right on the top. Actually, I had an x-ray done. There's the, there it is now. You'll notice the difference. It's much closer to the top of my hand. Now it's much further down towards the center of my finger and thumb area, so it has migrated itself a little bit. Makes it a little bit more hard to use. Used to be a lot easier. Um, so quick demo, I've got, uh, that's the schematic for this particular device if you're interested. Uh, the code will be up online soon. As I said, we've got hid cards. Don't work. So, yay. Hey. Thanks. I did a thing. Um, this is sort of a last minute. Hey, we got it working, finally. Uh, so that was that. And real quick, lessons learned. Uh, this is probably the most important stuff. Um, it might not work right away. Oh, by the way, you can't, Im you can't program it while still in a syringe. Um, oddly enough, these are medical grade stainless steel, so you can't, uh, the radio doesn't work through this. Uh, figured that out the hard way after about a week. Um, and it may not work right away. So after you get it injected, uh, it's very probable that for a couple of days or a week, you're not actually going to read it, uh, that the HID readers aren't going to pick it up because all the inflammation around the injection site. So uh, it didn't work and it didn't work. And then one day I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to try it on the outside door. And I tried it and I was just ecstatic because I got in my office with my hand. 
Um, one thing we were just recently learning that these chips are so small, the way that the antenna is wound and the way that the magnetic field comes off of the hid readers, uh, the orientation of the chip makes a really big difference. If you'll notice, I was kind of contorting my hand to get it to read because it's sort of in an awkward angle inside my hand. So when you have it implanted, if you want to have one of these implanted, make sure you kind of understand where you're going to be using it or in a, in a good orientation that's going to be easy for you. Uh, personally, if I was going to do it again, I'd probably put it on the back of my hand so I could walk up to the door sort of like this instead of all twisted around. Um, <clears throat> obviously, make sure that you get one that's rewritable. They do have read-only ones. Uh, so unless you have a really gracious employer and you can walk up to them and say, please make my ID this, um, which not many places do that, so make sure you get one that you can reprogram. Or, um, and, oh, I found it extremely difficult to find someone to implant me. I went to my doctor, I went to piercers, tattoo artists. Wisconsin apparently is a very conservative city because I couldn't find anybody, which is why we ended up doing it in my office. Because um, it's like, I can't find anybody. And my buddy's like, I'll do it. So, okay. Um, for as smart as we are, we're not that smart. Uh, so the big question is, is it worth it? Do you want one? Do you want to do this sort of thing? Um, I guess it depends. I like it. I can uh, unlock uh, my office doors. I'm building a rig like this that I'm going to actually be able to put into my house uh, so I can walk up to my home instead of have a key. I can just badge in like I'm at my office, right? So handy stuff. People have rigged it up to their cars, motorcycles, things like that. So um, Some of the resources. The, uh, the code, the main code that I've used was off of GitHub. Uh, by the way, these slides will be up online, so I don't have to frantically write down the big long URLs. And uh, I'm going to put the code out that actually runs this rig as well out on our page, which is mayhemlab.net. Uh, questions? I'll kind of breeze through that real quick, but I think I have a few minutes. No? If not, slides will be up online if anyone's interested. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep.